for the opportunity to sing songs to you that reminds us of who you are, what you are doing and what you have promised to do and what you have already done that re-engage our mind to you because so often we drift, focusing on the commonalities of life. Thank you for an opportunity to refocus, realign ourselves. Thank you, Father, for the persecuted brothers and sisters as we remember them in prayer. Many men and women, boys and girls of different ethnic groups and different classes and different societal levels are suffering in a way that we could never imagine because they are being true to Jesus alone. They are being true to the word of God that has been revealed in the scriptures. They are forsaking the cares of this world to follow after you. And sometimes that goes against the grain of those who hate you, who despise you, who reject you, and they suffer for your sake. We pray for their strength. We pray for their boldness of speech in the midst of the persecution and tribulation. Because as we read earlier in Matthew 13, so many flee when persecution and trials and tribulations come heavy, validating that their profession is not real that there are no roots that go deep and are steadfast no matter which way the winds, the currents blow and flow. Help us, Father, to develop that same kind of strength of conviction. Not believing facts, but having convictions that give us deep roots so that when the winds and the waves of persecution and testing and trials come, we will be found faithful because our faith is in you and you alone. Speak to us this morning. Speak clearly, speak concisely. Convert those who need to be converted. Convict those who need to be convicted. Comfort those who need to be comforted. Challenge those who need to be challenged. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory because you do all the work. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say, amen. The enemy is known as regression or falling away. Many people are confused in some of these texts in Hebrews because they don't keep them in the context that the writer is writing about. And Sometimes he's talking about those who profess something but do not possess it. And sometimes he's talking and reassuring those whose profession match up with how they live and how they walk because their faith is rock solid and their faith is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He's writing to an audience of Hebrews, but there are also some Gentiles. And he's writing to an audience of professing Jews or Hebrews who profess faith in God, but they reject Jesus Christ. They profess faith in the Messiah who is yet to come because you understand and should understand by now that the Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So they rejected Christ. They rejected his teachings. They rejected what he stood for rather than believing in him and trusting in him for the forgiveness of their sins. It's a very Jewish Hebrew audience, but it has great application for modern day church people. Because there are many in churches who profess faith in Christ, but don't live out the faith they profess. And as we talked about it in Sunday school, sometimes we're asking questions about people who are really not possessors of salvation. Y'all didn't hear that. They're asking questions. And they're coming up with their own ideas of how to live out life rather than standing on what God has already said about the life he birthed you 
to live. And the huge point behind this text is no one who truly has placed their faith in Christ, no one that God has truly saved, no one who has truly been born again from above by the word of God and by the spirit of God ever falls away or regresses. But there are people who have professed with their mouth, but there was really no transformation inwardly that fall away regularly. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the sheep and the goat when they're all mixed together in the stall or the sheep's pen. Though they were Hebrews who professed faith in Yahweh, many of the Hebrews ultimately rejected him and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his revelation thereby providing proof that they were not genuine believers. Chapter 6, 1 through 8, is not talking about genuine believers. No genuine believer, no truly born-again person can fall or will ever fall away. There is no such thing as getting started in Christ and then falling away from Christ for the true believer. We can have moments. We may even have a situation, but as a way of life, having started the true believer that has been born again by the Spirit and the Word of God and by the Father himself because of their faith in Jesus Christ never regresses and never falls away. But people who profess and do not possess life eternally will and can fall away. Now it's very easy if you read the text to see that. Look at verse 9 of the text. Let me just help you out a little bit. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. See, right there is a clue. Those who are really brethren and sister, and those who have really been born again, he says we do not expect this that we find in verses 1 through 8 of you. So verses 1 through 8 cannot be talking about a true born-again believer. But our churches, just like back here, are filled with people who profess one thing but don't have the reality of possessing the thing they profess. And because of trials and troubles and tribulations and testing, because of the cares of this world, they eventually fall away or they regress and go back, much like the children of Israel wanted to go back to Egypt because they did not like being uncomfortable in the wilderness. Now, if you don't understand this, you end up listening to dialogue and people who will confuse you. Many of you know that you have family members. You have friends. You have associates who all started out like they believed. And now you can't find them. But we continue to tell them that they're saved. That they're on their way to heaven and the truth of the matter, they're on their way to hell. And this text is absolutely clear about that. Now, you can dismiss it. You can say, I don't believe it. But one day you will know for sure. And the reason you may not believe the text is because you don't believe the God who revealed the text. That you got a truth of your own design. And sometimes we want to save people because we just don't want to believe. Because we lack faith in what God has said and what God means by what he says. My purpose this morning is to call the hearer to the warning about the danger of falling away and regression. It is possible to be in church, but not to be in Christ. It's possible to be filled 
with knowledge about the word of God and knowledge about Christ and knowledge about God, but Christ not be in you. It's possible to go through church all your life and be lost in church. It's possible. We know it's possible because the Jews did it. They saw all the miracles. They saw all the signs. They saw all the wonders of God. They had the prophets. They had Moses. They had Joshua. Yet when it came time to show what they believed, many of them died never entering God's rest of the promised land. It's possible. That's why we started in Joshua and brought you to Hebrews. Because we want to show you that it is possible, that it has happened before. That these Jews, these Hebrews, who prayed for over 400 years under the Egyptian bondage, and God sent them Moses, a deliverer, and he did all kinds of miracles we call plagues. And they saw the power and might and tasted the glory of God. And they left on their way to the promised land of Canaan. But in the wilderness, they regressed and wanted to go back. They fell away. And many of them never entered the promised land. That Old Testament illustration, that Old Testament reality that is more than just a bedtime story is a warning for New Testament believers. Because it is possible for you to have seen, to have tasted, to have experienced the working of the spirit and the power of God's word in your life, but it never changed you inwardly. There are three principles related to the warning of falling away and regression. Let me give them to you and then we'll look at each one. A lot of, to share with you. Hopefully we can get through it all. The first principle is this. The reign of immaturity multiplies regression. The reign of immaturity multiplies regression. Secondly, the rejection of illumination maintains regression. The rejection of illumination maintains regression. Verse 4 through 6. Finally, the rule of the illustration marks regression. Verses 7 and 8. The rule of the illustration marks regression. This, this text makes it so very clear to those who are able to discern good from evil, those who are able to discern what the word of God is saying, those who have life. We know that in chapter 4 of Hebrews. Look at chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are what? Naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Listen, brothers and sisters, when the word of God preached in the power of the Spirit, goes out, or you read it, it accomplishes what God intends for it to accomplish. And if you are a sinner who needs to be saved, if you are still lost in your sins and trespasses, if you have not truly put your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, the Spirit will do its work to make that absolutely clear to you. But it is possible for you to fool yourself and be fooled by your flesh and the evil one and this world system that you are something that you really are not. It is possible. It is not only possible, it is probable. 
it is possible for us like the Jews believe, to believe we are descendants of Abraham when we're really not. Because Romans chapter 4 says, if you do not demonstrate the faith of Abraham, you are not his children just because you are Hebrew and just because you are a Jew. There needs to be a new birth. You must be born again. You must be saved by faith through grace, and your faith must be in Jesus Christ alone. But you cannot get to God the Father and not go through Jesus. See, these Jews would not have had a problem with Yahweh, with, with God, the God of the Old Testament. But that's the old covenant. The new covenant says you must come to Yahweh, God the Father, through Jesus Christ. For Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come unto the Father but by. But if Jesus is not the Messiah, if Jesus is not the one you must come to, if Jesus is not the one you must believe in, then you don't get to the Father under the new covenant unless you go through Jesus. And it must be more than just intellectual information you have about Jesus. It must be faith in Jesus. You must place your whole weight and trust in Jesus for what he has done on your behalf to save you. But you know your Bibles, don't you? When Jesus came riding through the town on the, little, on the white coat, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they laid palm branches by, but, but within a week, they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. How do you flip the script in a week? Well, you know it. By the time y'all live here, some of y'all will flip the script. You have sung the songs that you sung this morning, and you would have read the scriptures and heard the scriptures. You would have heard the message and walk right out the door and go right back to the world. It's possible. Let's look at this first principle related to the warning of falling away and regression. The reign of immaturity multiplies regression. Look at verses 1 through 3. Therefore, he has already talked about, as we talked about last time, spiritual immaturity in verses 12 through 14. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Now, don't run too fast. All the types of the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the priesthood, all the things he's talking about, the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, they were all elementary principles about Christ. They were all types of what Christ would be. Now that Christ has come, leave the elementary things and come to maturity in Christ. Is anybody with me this morning? See, we got some elementary things about Jesus. He's a wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's a bright morning star. He's my doctor. He's all, that's elementary stuff. You need to leave the elementary and grow up. By coming to Christ. Because he's the reality. Those are the elementaries. And our churches are full of people who are still in grade school. Been going to church 20 years. 30 years. 40 years. 50 years. But they've still got first grade faith. If they got faith at all. Because they're not maturing. And if you're not maturing, you're regressing. And you will eventually will fall away. There's the necessity of leaving the initial lessons about Christ. That's how it really reads in the Jewish Bible, in the Hebrew. Leave the initial lessons about Christ. They're all types. The priesthood, the tabernacle, the, 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 the ceremonial laws, and all of those things that they were commanded to do in the Old Testament were to point you to Christ. They were to explain to you the depth, breadth, and width of what Christ would accomplish when he came. But they didn't want to leave those things. 
They rejected Christ and were trying to hang on to the law. They were trying to hang on to the washing. They were trying to hang on to the ceremony, dietary law. They were trying to hang on to the priesthood. And do you know Jews are still trying to do that today? A Jew in this time period, this administration, the dispensation must come to faith like a Gentile must come to faith by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection and person of Jesus Christ. But if we were to take a church over to Jerusalem, they're still trying to do the elementary principles. Why? Because they have rejected Christ. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come. That's why the Antichrist will fool them. Because when he came in his first coming, they did not receive him as the Messiah. He tells them, therefore, leaving the discussion. Let's stop talking about the elementary stuff. The elementary principles, the lessons about Christ. Let's leave the foundational beginning teachings about Christ and press on towards maturity, which is faith in Christ. Secondly, the necessity for pressing towards forward to maturity in Christ, he says in this verse. Leave the elementary principles. Let us go on to perfection. Let us press on. If you read Philippians chapter 3, isn't that what Paul says? He had to consider all that elementary stuff, all that stuff that he thought made him righteous with God and made him right with God. He had to consider that all dung, and he had to press on to the knowledge of knowing Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection and the power that raised him from the grave because that's where you find new life. You can't hang on to the elementary stuff and hang on to the maturity at the same time. You can't try to eat Gerber's and eat steak at the same time. If you're eating Gerber's, it's because you can't eat steak. You'll choke on steak because all you can handle is Gerber's. And our churches are full of Gerber Christians. People who have not been able to discern good from evil, better from best, right from wrong, writer from writer. Salvation by faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ alone, not in foundational types that were meant to point people to Christ. The verb here is in the passive in the Greek, so it is, is to indicate, let us be carried to salvation. Do you know no, no one carries themselves to salvation? God must carry you to salvation. No one wakes up one day, you know, I think today is a good day to get saved. I just got a feeling. I don't know why. But when God carries you to salvation, he shows you your evilness. He shows you your wickedness. He shows you that you're a transgressor of the law of God. He shows you that you're, you're unredeemed, that you're in darkness, and that you must come to the marvelous light. And you don't get that by praying a prayer after me. You get that by divine revelation based on what the word of God says about you. You're dead in sins and trespasses. You must be made alive. And only God can do that. No preacher can preach you into that. We can direct you on the path you need to go, but only God can motivate you to go. If you saved anybody, they still lost. Salvation is a divine work of God that starts inwardly but needs to hear the word outwardly so there's a partnership that goes on if we aren't telling people what they need to hear how do they hear without a preacher the Bible says 
That's why you're going to need some courage in these last days. Because people don't want to hear the truth. As God's truth says. Yes, we like to gather in small groups. And we love to talk about our problems and what's wrong and how we feel. And, and you can get that as psychiatry. But what a psychiatrist will not tell you is you're laying on this couch talking about all these symptoms is because you got a root problem with God. Washington is not going to tell you the reason why we have all this crime and all this injustice and all these things that are going on in our culture is because people have a sin problem. And all they can produce is wickedness. Selfishness, envy, bitterness, jealousy, murder, sexual immorality. They're not going to tell you that. That might hurt your little feelings. But God's not concerned about your feelings first. He's concerned about righteousness first. And therefore, anybody who's been born of him is concerned about what he's concerned about First, people want to come to meetings and just talk about how they feel. And don't correct how I feel, because that's how I feel. Don't ask me why I feel that way. Just let me tell you how I feel. Don't, 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 be, don't be opening the Bible. Showing other people who felt the way I felt. And the Bible says here's why they felt the way they felt. is because they did not know God. They did not trust God. They did not have faith in God. That's not what I came to the small groups for. I came for you to be my friend. To be my sister and brother in Christ. Now I'm willing to listen to all that for a bit. But can I get to the root of the problem so we can move on? Because we got some other problem people in here that got issues, and you hogging up the whole time. Oh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? I may not be at the meetings, but I know what goes on. No, 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 no. The Bible, according to what we just read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, can get to the root of your problem quickly. But I don't want to get to the root of the problem. I just want to talk about my problem. I didn't come here to be fixed. I came here just so I could dump. That's a person that's on the path of regression and falling away. Now, we who are mature should understand where they are because we all have been there. But we all should understand if you stay there, that's not going to help you. We must get to the reality of the truth. Anybody who's been truly born again wants the word of God to do what the word of God can only do on the inside and help me with my outside. He says there's a necessity of laying aside foundational principles pointing to Christ. Look at this again in verse 1. Let us press on to perfection, to maturity. Are you pressing towards maturity? You're not pressing towards maturity if you're not willing to lay aside elementary stuff. Are y'all with me? He says, press on, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. You should know that you need to repent by now. You should know all your efforts to make yourself right and make yourself look good and to make yourself right with God is nothing but dead works. And you need to turn from that. That's elementary stuff. You understand, Mr. and Mrs. Hebrew and Jew, 
that you had to come and give sacrifices time after time after time after time again, and that bull, the blood of bulls and goats really couldn't do anything about your sin. They were all symbols to point you to the reality of Christ shedding his blood once and for all for you so that you don't have to do sacrifices over and over again under the new covenant. Aren't you glad you don't have to bring sacrifices to me? And I got to have an altar and get all bloody for you and lay my hands on the sacrifice as a symbol of your repenting from your sin and do that week after week and year after year? That you can come to faith in Christ who is the Lamb of God who sacrificed himself one time and doesn't have to be sacrificed over and over again? Leave the elementary and come to maturity. The idea about dead works or repentance from dead works is turning from works that lead to death. Christ's atoning sacrifice is the only work that saves man from their own self-righteous works. That's why you got to be careful about songs you listen to. If you climbing up the right, the right side of the mountain, doing your best to get it in, you don't understand you've been saved from dead works. Your climbing is a work that will never cease because you'll never get in by your works. But if you hold on to Jesus, and Jesus holds on to you, you don't have to climb up the right side of the mountain all the time. And some of y'all can't go down the aisle while huffing and puffing. I don't know how you get up a mountain. <laughs> Doing your best to make it in. And people sing that song loud and proud, don't even have a clue. That's dead work singing. But it's not surprising if you're regressing and you have fallen away. Because people who are regressing and falling away would never be able to discern that's not biblical. So I be listening to some of the songs y'all be listening to. Uh-huh. They don't even know what's wrong with that song. Because they're not maturing. They're not growing. See, when you were a baby, you may not have understood what was wrong with those songs. You may not have understood what was wrong with that particular false teacher on television. But if you're maturing, you should by now be able to say, hey, that don't match up with what Christ has done. That doesn't match up what God's word has said. And if you don't know, and there's some other mature people who do know, and they try to tell you what you don't know, and you get an attitude about what they're telling you, that's because you may be regressing and you may be falling away. You have profession, but you don't have possession. You profess that you love Jesus. You profess that you have been saved, but you don't really possess it. Because you're still dependent on dead works. What else are you dependent on? He says, faith directed only towards the Father is unacceptable without faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. Look at this verse. He says, repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. See, a Jew and a Hebrew would have believed in Yahweh. They did not believe in Jesus Christ. And it is unacceptable to say, I believe in God, but you don't believe in Jesus. Being the son of God. Being the sacrifice offered by God. Being the sacrifice sent by God. Is anybody hearing me today? There are people who say we all believe in the same God. Okay, what you say about Jesus? Oh, I, don't, I think Jesus was a good teacher. Did not Jesus deal with that in Matthew 16? Who do men say that I am? And they came up with all kinds of statements about, then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And by divine revelation, Peter got it right. You are the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Be careful when Jesus called your full name. 
Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father. There's a difference between having information about Jesus and divine revelation from God about Jesus. Makes all the difference in the world. Acts 4.12 would put it this way, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You can't say I believe in God and don't believe in what God says about Jesus. On the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew 17, he tells James, John, and Peter, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. If God has unveiled that to you, how do you come up with something different about Jesus? Is anybody with me? And I'm saying this because it's because imp- y'all got people in your family who said they made a profession and we can't find them. They have no interest in Jesus. They have no interest in living a life after Jesus. They have no interest in in the church. They have no interest in discipleship. They have no interest in sanctification. But you keep telling them they saved. And you don't have enough courage to tell them, no, you're not. And you say, come to church and hear Pastor Clay. He'll tell you, even though we won't tell you. Well, you're supposed to be telling them the same thing I'm telling them. If you believe the same thing God believes. Jews were fooling themselves. Those, pe- those Jews in the woman were fooling themselves. They just caught think because they were among the people that they were really followers of God until their faith got tested. And if God is not testing your faith, you know why he's not testing your faith? Because you're not his. Listen, you can't test faith that you don't have. <laughs> he says, laying aside the foundational principles, pointing to Christ, doctrines of washings. Your text says baptism, but it's better translated washing. The ceremonial washings were all uh, illustrations of purity that God required. But what use is it to practice the washings when it really can't wash away your sins, but Christ's blood washes away your sin, and you reject the Christ and his blood? Because you're still focusing on what? The elementary foundations. Y'all see how this goes together? See, you have to think very Jewish to get the point. Laying aside the laying on hands, ordination, healing, ordination of the priests, healing of people, sacrifices. The priest had to lay his hand on the sacrifice as a symbol of identifying with the sins of the people now in the sacrifice. You don't have to do that under the new covenant. But Jews still try to practice these things. He goes on to talk about resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. All of those are foundational things that point you to the reality of Christ. And now that Christ has come, leave the elementary principles, lay them aside, press on to maturity. Maturity is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's what this text is saying. But if you don't do that, if your profession doesn't reflect in your practice in the way that gives evidence to your profession, your profession does you no good. Then he says in verse 3, And this we will do if God permits. Nobody can lay aside the foundational principles unless God does a work in their life. Listen, verse 3 is a conventional phrase that acknowledges the need for God's help in learning and teaching Christian doctrine. 
It uses, it uses suggests that the material to follow is difficult as indeed it is. He's going to say some things in the coming verses four through six that are difficult to understand. That's why the church has gotten it twisted. But we're going to straighten it out for you this morning. Listen to John 6, 4. No one comes to me, Jesus speaking, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Listen, if God has drawn you to Christ, if God has turned the light on so that you can see your need for Christ and that to believe in Christ, you will never regress and you will never fall away because you didn't bring yourself in. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. If I'm depending on me to keep me, I might as well give up now. That's why in Ephesians chapter 1, it says the Holy Spirit seals us to the day of redemption. But it doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit's work until it talks about the Son's work and it talks about the Father's work. Ephesians 1 through 14. God has done something. Christ has done something. And based on what God has done and what Christ has done, the Holy Spirit seals us to the day of redemption. Now, the question is, is there anyone powerful enough to break the seal? And the question, answer is no. If you win, you can't sin your way out. If you win, you ain't going to want to keep sinning, though. This leads us to the second point. The rejection of illumination maintains regression. The rejection of illumination maintains regression. Why are so many people still lost in all this truth that's going out? Why are there so many people in church who, who keep seeing the wonder and power and miraculous work of God in changing lives and doing this and doing that, and they still don't believe. Verse 4 through 6 helps us with that. Now, I, I didn't write verse 4. Please don't get mad at me. As Adrian Rogers would say, it's black print on white paper. <laughs> for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened You talking about mission impossible? This is impossible. It is absolutely impossible unless God does something. For someone who's been enlightened, now what, what do we mean by that? What, what does the writer mean by that? This is, this is the scriptures teaching this. This is a warning about those who have once been enlightened, that is to have had the knowledge of Christ disclosed in the gospel message. See, every time the preacher preaches, every time a witness witnesses and they tell them about Christ and what he's done for them on their behalf and why he needed to do it and why you needed to have it done, they have been enlightened. They have heard the truth they need to hear. The Holy Spirit has empowered you to be a witness, to be a preacher, to be a herald. The truth is going forth. They have heard what they need to hear. Turn to Hebrews 10, 26 to get some clarity on this. Hebrews 10, 26 says this. For if we sin willfully, Everybody want to know, what's the will for sin? I'm going to tell you what it is. After we have received the knowledge of the truth. What's the truth? The truth is Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the light, he said. Once they have heard about Christ, once they have heard the gospel, the good news about Christ, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. If they reject that truth, if they reject the truth about Christ and the truth about themselves, which shows them their need for Christ, if they reject that, there is no other way for them to be saved. That's what he's saying. 
They hear the gospel. They hear the bad news. They hear the good news. They hear why they need to be saved. They hear that they're lost in sins and trespass. They hear that they're dead in sins and trespass. They hear that they are under the first Adam. They need to come to the second Adam and what the second Adam has done on behalf. And they reject that. They willfully sin. And there is nothing that can save them when they reject that. Are y'all with me? This ain't talking about your practice of sin. We got other scriptures for that. The sin they're committing in this context is they will not leave the elementary things that point them to Christ and come to maturity in Christ. And when you reject that, there's no other way for you to be saved. Because Christ is the only way. That's what the writer of Hebrews is getting at. Y'all with me still? And some will even publicly profess in baptism. They'll go as far as to get dunked in the water. But over time, like the parable of the sower, just give it time. And the cares of this world will really show you they really weren't rooted. Just give it time and persecution and tribulation will show up and they will not be willing to suffer for his sake and they will fall away. Just give it time and the love of sin that they refuse to let go of, they will not let go and they'll drift away. Because you cannot hang out in the environment of truth where the truth is going forth and the Holy Spirit is doing his work week after week, Sunday after Sunday, Bible after Bible, Sunday, and be comfortable with that. You have to leave that environment. That's why they don't come to church anymore. I can't handle all that truth that is getting into my soul. I, I got to respond. I don't respond. But you do respond. When you reject, that is a response. And yet y'all keep telling them they saved. It's hard to have children you know are in this condition. But you're lying to yourself about it and going to help you and help them. You lead them under condemnation. It's quiet in here this morning. John 1, 9 puts it this way. That was the true light, meaning Christ, which gives light to every man coming into the world. There's so much light. There's no reason for you to be in darkness. But you know what Jesus says, they hated me because until I started talking about their sin, I was okay with them. As long as you don't talk about their sin, they're okay with me. But when I started talking about their sin and pointing out their sin, they hated me. See, people don't have a problem coming to small groups if they can just talk about their sin and nobody ever confronts them on it. But when you start confronting them, when you start taking them to the scriptures, when you try to start holding up light and they want to abide in darkness, y'all ain't feeling me up in here. Every time I come and I try to tell y'all what I'm struggling with, what I'm going through, y'all always want to take me to the scriptures. That's where the light at. Well, I didn't come here for light. I just came here to talk by a parrot. The church, according to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 15, is the pillar and support of the truth. The one place you ought to get the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, is in the household of God among the people of God. But if you're falling away and you're regressing, you don't want to hear truth. You want to hear, you are right in spite of yourself. God understands. You're only human. Ain't nobody perfect. And you're helping them to be condemned to hell. Because they're thinking they're okay, and they're not okay. They're thinking they have life, and they don't have life. 
They're thinking because they know a little Bible, can recite a few scriptures, can give you the truth about why Jesus came and why he died, but they've never had it as a reality for themselves. They think they're okay. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you're not okay. The scriptures clearly teaches that those whom God has truly saved will persevere in faith to the end. If God saved you, there may be some bumps, there may be some curves, there may be some ups and downs, but you're going to persevere to the end. Why? Because you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. You don't leave, you don't regress, you don't fall away from Christ. Turn to Hebrews 3.14 for some validation on this. He says in Hebrews 3.14, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, in other words, be courage, steadfast to the what? You don't begin and quit. The evidence is the perseverance of the saints. The evidence is not once saved, always saved. The evidence is do you persevere having begun to the end? See, some of us won't know we're going to, going to heaven until we get there and he don't throw us out. Because there was no evidence while we were on earth. See, the end is when you stand at the Bema seat. Then you know you have persevered to the end. There are bumps, there are curves, there are hiccups. There are moments when you're faithful, there are moments when you'll be unfaithful and you turn and get back to being faithful, but you really won't know till the end. See, that's why we can't judge you just based on profession. All we can do is when we baptize, based on the profession of your faith. Because I can't go inside you to see what you profess on the outside is really true on the inside. But you'll know by the end. And I'll know if you don't persevere to the end, your profession wasn't possession. Listen to John 10, 28, 29. Jesus says, and I give them eternal life. Who gives you eternal life? And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Now, how do you go back to the world? How do you get snatched back up in the world when he says nothing can snatch you out of his hand? How do you regress back to Egypt when he says nothing can snatch you out of my hand? How does your problems and tribulation and persecution make you go backwards rather than forward? Anybody getting this besides me? Now, some of us should be finding assurance here, and some of us be saying, uh-oh. <laughs> Depends on where you are. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Father's got you, and Jesus has got you. Holy Spirit has got you. How you drift back? How did you start out looking like you were going with Christ and now we can't find you? You don't want the Bible. You don't want church. You don't want to be around Christian folk. You Listen. Listen to this statement. Therefore, understanding the gospel is not equal to regeneration. People can recite the facts all day long. Don't mean they've been regenerated. The proof of regeneration is that you start and you finish. You persevere to the end. They don't go back to the world. They don't go back to the old lifestyle. They hunger and thirst after righteousness, the Bible said. They endure through tribulation and persecution because Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. You don't renege on your profession of faith. 
because things get hard and difficult? So that's the principle of being enlightened. Then there's the principle of having tasted the heavenly gift. This is the idea of consciously expressing something. The light goes off. They're enlightened. They, they, they understand the truth. But they reject the truth they now understand. They've tasted the heavenly gift of the working of the Holy Spirit and the gospel truth coming forward into their soul, and they reject it. They saw Jesus and rejected God in human flesh. They knew what the Old Testament said about the Messiah, where he would be born, the miracles he would perform, the things he would say, and Jesus did all of that, and they still rejected him. How is that? And people still do it today. They see people in here who have changed lives. And they see how they're hungry and thirsting after things of God, how sin is falling off. And they see the miracle that God has been performing in, in the new birth and, how, and their commitment and the gifts bringing off backwards and forward and forwards and backwards. And they still refuse to believe. They hear the gospel being preached all over the world and they still refuse to believe. Hebrews 2.9 says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Come on, think about it now. Go back to Calvary. You already been there once this morning. We go back again. You can never see Calvary too many times. How is it that all those Jewish people knew what the Bible said about the Messiah? Heard Jesus speak for 33 and a half years. Saw him where he was grown up and saw where he traveled and saw the healings and the miracles and reject him as the Messiah when he hung on the cross. How is that? They didn't have enough enlightenment. The Holy Spirit really wasn't working on them. Or did they choose not to believe? How is it that you have the disciples in John 6, 60 to 66, which we read in the scripture here, following Jesus, but because he raises the standard and you don't want to come in line with the standard, you leave him. You know, people have done that here at this church. Oh, you can get the word over a dynamic life. The word is, ooh, the word is tight. The word, woo, the word, the word. They expect you to live that stuff, though. This ain't entertainment. We ain't speaking just to be entertaining you. We ain't trying to scratch your itchy ears. We're trying to lay out the standard. And everybody who's been born of God wants to live according to that standard. We struggle, we fall, we fail, but we long after him. They tasted the heavenly gift. The Holy Spirit did his work and they rejected him. Then there's the principle of partaking of the work of the Spirit in verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit worked. The Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. The Holy Spirit works in the New Testament under the New Covenant and people reject his work. And when you reject the work of the Spirit, you are going to fall away and you are going to regress. What did the Holy Spirit do? Let me give you several things. They witnessed the mir miraculous miracles of God, Hebrews 2.4. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. God did all these miracles, Red Sea, pillars of fire, cloud by night, this and that, and they rejected. 
You know, we live in a society that just needs one more miracle to believe that God is real. And so God's got to be like some performing clown in a circus for you. One more healing, one more miraculous this, one more blessing, one more fill in the blank. They witnessed the miraculous miracles of God and still did not believe. Died in the wilderness because of unbelief. Secondly, they experienced the convicting work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8 says, and when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit is going to do when he comes. When did he come? On the day of Pentecost. When will he leave? When that work is over. But since he came, and in between he leaves, guess what he's doing? He's convicting the world and sinners of their sin. But we as believers don't want to witness the people about their sin. But I thought you were indwelt and filled with the Spirit, and if the Spirit is going to convict them of their sin, and you're going to be a witness by the power of the Holy Spirit, why are you not talking about their sin? Because they won't like me. Get over yourself. They may kick me out the family. You got a new family. I might lose my job. Who do you think gave you that job? They might not let me. Who cares? Our job is to be faithful witnesses in the power and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if he's come to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, then we who are the witnesses are supposed to be doing that work because he's working in us to do it. But the modern day church wants to be people's friends more than they want to be witnesses. Thirdly, they testified of the miracles or the miraculous ministry of Jesus Christ. I don't have time to take you through all the scriptures, but Matthew 12, 28, 32 deals with it. The whole book of Hebrews deals with this. Luke 14, 14 says, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Luke 14, 18, but, all, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have brought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask that you have me excused. People got excuses after excuses for excuses for why not following and giving their allegiance to Jesus Christ and none of the excuses will work. We all got excuses for why we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And none of them are valid. Because if the Spirit of God is working in your life, whatever the Spirit was sent to do, whoever he indwells in his feeling will do what he was sent to do. And whatever you've been gifted to do by God, whatever you've been called to do by God, you must do it because the Spirit empowers you and enables you and equips you to do it. Now, we can grieve the Spirit and we can quench the Spirit. But ability is not your problem. Knowing what to do and what to say is not your problem. Your unbelief is your problem. Fourth. They resisted without experiencing salvation, regeneration, new birth, or justification. People who resist the Spirit cannot be being saved by the Spirit. Fifthly, they tasted the goodness of God's Word. Wish I had more time. I'm going to have to stop right here. The example of Simon Magnus in Acts 8, 9, 24 ought to be a, be a warning for all of us. The example of the false disciples in John 6, 60 through 66 ought to be a warning for all of us. The example of illegitimate hearts found in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, 3 to 9 ought to be a warning for all of us. The example of the newborns ought to be an example for all of us. A newborn babe desires the pure milk of the word. A newborn babe desires fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. A newborn babe realizes he must be in the incubator of God's church in order to press on towards maturity so they don't fall back into regression to immaturity. 
Immature people are asking, why we got to go to church? Why we got to go to small groups? Why we need this? Why we need that? Isn't being saved enough? No, it's not being enough. Because salvation is supposed to produce something in your life. Good works. It's supposed to produce fruit. That's the point of the illustration in verse 6 and 8, 7 and 8. But we're going to have to wait till next week so I can break that down for you. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We have strived as best as we know how by your power, by your might to explain your word to your people. And each of us must deal with where we're at in line with what we have just heard. I pray that there's no one in here who's regressing or who's in danger of falling away. But I happen to know, just like the people of Israel that we find in this text, just like the people who are Hebrews in this text, unbelief can be in our life. And we must carefully evaluate and be evaluated by your word and by your spirit to make sure we're not guilty of not entering the rest that you have promised us in Christ Jesus. Guide your people. Bless your people. And if there's anyone this morning who's here who does not know Christ and the forgiveness of it, they've never come to him by faith so that they can experience new life and life more abundantly. May they ask someone, what must I do to be saved before they leave this place this morning? Because tomorrow is not promised to you. Today is the day of your salvation, if you would just respond. And as you do this, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus.